So we are on chapter 20 and uh, 21 at least tonight. Probably will not go past that because 22 gets into some things that could be a session by itself. So uh, we'll probably just cover those two chapters. Um, and I can start off by reading them. Let's see, go to chapter 20. <clears throat> oh. we go. Okay, chapter 20. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Now Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sa um, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are going to you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, She is my sister? And she and she even herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I, uh, integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. Now therefore restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pay, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are, are who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all of his servants, and told all the, all the things that in their hearing, and the men were very afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you, uh, what did you have in view that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me on account of my wife. But indeed, she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said to her, This is your kindness that you should do for me in every place wherever we go. Say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah his wife to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Then Sarah said, Behold, I, uh, then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your, uh, your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all um, who are with you and before all others. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his maidservants. Then, uh, then they bore children. For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, set him, uh, I'm sorry, at the set time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then uh, Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh so that all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said Abraham uh, said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, so the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Abraham, I'm sorry, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. Then she said to Abraham, Cast out this bomb woman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing to Abraham's sight, in Abraham's sight because of his son. 
But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of the, your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac shall your seed be called. Yet I will also make a nation of uh, make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it uh, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba, and the water skin and the water in the skin was dried up, and she placed the boy under um, under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across, uh, across from him at a distance, about a, st- a bow shot. For she said to herself, Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham, out, I'm sorry, to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and um, lift up the lad, and take hold with your uh, take him with take hold of him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Then she went and filled the skin with water and gave it to the lad to drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took. I'm sorry, and his mother, mother took a wife for him of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass at the time of Ab- uh, that Abimelech and um, Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or with my posterity, and that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I swear. Then Abraham reproved, uh, reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I did not know, um, I, do not, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them uh, made a covenant. And Abraham sent seven ewe lambs on the, um, of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, You will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that it may be my witness that I have dug this well. Therefore he called that place Beersheba, because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Pekal and the, com- the commander of his armies, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines many days. Now, so those are the two chapters we're going to look at tonight. What um, are some of the thoughts that you guys had as you went through it? No, I'm not getting into that discussion again. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, uh, obviously, this is before Sarah conceived Isaac. The first chapter that we read is, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but how, and the wombs of all the women of Abimelech's of Abimelech's had been close. Mm -hmm. So do we have any idea of how long a time period? Probably not very long at all because if he had, he called to have um, her brought to him, obviously with the intention of making her his wife. So um, more than likely if he was interested in her, he probably wasn't going to be waiting six months before he was going to be with her. But it also got stopped him from fooling around with her. Exactly. Yes, he did. So uh, uh, more than likely, it was a short period of time. Uh, you know, uh, it's possible that God may have kept him from uh, from fooling around with her before for six months, but there's no reason to interpret it that way. Um, it's I mean, probably some, very somehow, short. I, I don't know. Just somehow or another, they have to have had enough time to figure out that none of the women were conceiving. Well, God told them in a dream. So, uh, so I mean, He knew. It was not because of the fact that time had passed and they could tell the children mm-hmm. weren't being born to them. It just tells us, for God had shut up their womb. That's the only 
That's the only thing that we have on that. It doesn't say that Abimelech knew it. He just knew he was going to die if he didn't return Sarah. Chances are God didn't wait six months to tell him. He probably told him right away. He, he had her brought to his house, and probably that night he had a bad vision. Just like Potiphar's wife had a bad vision about, um, uh, about uh, um, Jesus being brought before him. You know, I've suffered many things this night in a dream about him, and she suffered it the night before he was brought. Um, more than likely, this was the same thing on the same night. So, uh, no, it also protected Sarah. The, mm -hmm. Nothing could be said that Isaac could possibly be anybody's but Abraham's. That's right. Absolutely. You're right. That's a good point. Very good point. And, uh, and Abimelech actually went the extra mile here. <laughs> You know, granted, he, uh, in some respects, he might have been doing it just for fear of his life, but he definitely went the extra mile. I mean, God just said, return her. But he not only returned her, he also gave things to Abraham. He also gave what was in their land a token of her purity by buying back her honor by giving a thousand pieces of silver to Abraham, which made it so that in his land, anybody who looked at her would not think that they'd fooled around. So it restored her honor. And on top of that, he said, Behold my lands before you, settle wherever you want to. So, I mean, he, he went above and beyond just giving her back to him. So, uh, um, and we can see as we kept on reading through the two chapters that God blessed Abimelech because of that. And this is, a, it, this is interesting because it, in many, 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 many chapters and books actually later, we're going to see how um, there, there comes a time when David is ruling on the throne, like a thousand years, for a thousand four hundred years from what we're reading right now, and the Philistines know that this God of the Israelites is a powerful God, and so they wanted the Ark of the Covenant in their land so that it would bless their land, right? And uh, and so the Philistines came and took it, right? You know, so um, uh, this the name of God was gaining reputation around the world, uh, that part of the world. And also remember, Shem is still alive. So you've got people that are directly connected to the flood in the pre-flood world that these people have rubbed shoulders with on some, either directly or indirectly by lore. Um, they've heard about it. So you notice that one, a very interesting thing is Abimelech, when God shows up in a dream, seems to know what God this is. Right? And, and he seems to know his character because... He's saying almost exactly like Abraham, would the God of the universe right. do what it's wrong and judge the innocent? Right, exactly. Well, any of the other gods would have. Yeah. <laughs> the Egyptians' God would have. The Philistine gods would have. They would have done whatever they wanted to do. But would the God that is the God of the flood, the God of creation, the God of Abraham, would he do what is wrong and judge the innocent? Mm -hmm. He knew this instinctively about this God. So the name of God was still very well known in the earth, even though men were building up their own idols and creating entire religious systems around false gods. They knew a real God existed. Mm -hmm. And yet their hearts did not swoon to him at all, even though they knew he existed. They were clearly afraid of him too, right? Yeah. I mean, he comes in a dream and says, you're a dead man. Mm -hmm. You know, if that were done today... A lot of people would just brush it off and say, well, that was just bad pizza, you know? But they're like, uh, if, if it was even a hint that this was the God, he was taking this serious. He brings it up to all of his servants the, day, the next morning, and they're terrified. So, you know, God's name has not been watered down enough yet from the flood that people were not fearing him. So uh, these are kind of interesting things. Other thoughts? Yeah. Been looking up... Uh but one thing I found out that Abimelech may have been one of the kings that established Jerusalem for Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting. I mean, that connected that with this mm -hmm. to, for me. Well, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking, well, that, that would be a recognition of Melchizedek. They mm -hmm. recognized you know, a man of God here. Yeah. And so this may have, and he calls himself a righteous nation. Mm -hmm. um, so he may, just in my own thinking, may have, you know, I'm honoring God, building, helping build this city of 
Jerusalem for Melchizedek, mm-hmm. you know, on, on, and it connects the righteous thing. Um, it, another thing that stuck out to me was, what is this that you have done to us? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I feel like, you know, how many times have I I've done that to somebody? Mm-hmm. I've put a stumbling block in front of their their eyes or in their life and still um, made a mess of things and God still spoke to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. he still made a covenant with me and he's not backing off. Mm-hmm. And it, it just absolutely, um, what we do is so important for the honor of God. Mm-hmm. Oh. But it's a, it's a clear problem in the lineage of Abraham of having deceitful people. I mean, it follows them for generations. Yes. And, you know, and he's, I mean, he excuses it as a loophole argument that, well, she is my sister. You know, like, well, you know, she's really kind of like your half sister. And, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you're just using that as a cloak for your vice. You, you, you lied. You were deceptive. And you know you were. That's why you're squirming. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, you first. I just looked at that as, a, again, kind of like a, the seed of Adam rising up because he was kind of stepping back and hiding. And, mm-hmm. You know, this was his cop out rather than standing up and mm-hmm. trusting God. Exactly. God who had made covenant with him to look out for, I mean, especially this time. I mean, the first yeah. time, maybe not as much, but after all these years of seeing God interact in his life, yeah. he's a new man now and in covenant solid with God. Mm-hmm. You would think that he could stand up at this point, this time, and trust God to take care of him and yeah. fight for him rather than being deceptive. Yeah, exactly. But instead he uh, he gets in fear and he becomes his own rescuer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What they thought, what they considered or thought of women back there would, must have been nothing more than a cattle. L- look well, at Lot. in a way. Look at Lot, and mm-hmm. he offered his daughters. Mm-hmm. Yes. And Abraham allowed Sarah mm-hmm. to go into Abimelech. Well, to be taken. Yes. To be taken, but mm-hmm. he knew. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like he was <coughs> yeah. really selfish. Yeah. Huh? Well, I mean, that, you're right. I mean, but in that, in that day, there was no knowledge that that was... Wrong. I mean, you have to understand this. There's a way in which men understood what they were more clearly then than they do now. But the problem is that it was also distorted by the fall. Men understood instinctively from creation that the woman was created for him. He wasn't created for her. She was created for me. Now you view that through a distorted, fallen lens. And that makes her whatever Creative I need her to be. Woman. Yeah, whatever I need her to be. She becomes a possession of that. <coughs> and, uh, you know, so, I mean, it's through... They had no problem, and, and, and this, is, this is pervasive around the planet. The reason why feminism fails everywhere it goes is because, number one, it's not right, it's not godly. It runs against the, 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 the decided order of creation. But everywhere on the planet... It's always been that the men were in charge. It's always been that way. Even in, in completely pagan nations, it's always that way. And, and, and women instinctively understand that. Unless they're in a society that's lived for free for so long that they begin to go up and begin to think, well, I've got my own rights and I don't have to live, I can live independent of you and I can make a name for myself. And now they begin to swing the pendulum on the other end and it's just as evil as what these people are doing on the other side. So, you know, uh, but I bring that up only to say that mankind at this point had not gotten so far away from original intent and creation as to not realize their role in things. The problem is that they were acting it out through an ungodly lens, an ungodly filter, which caused them or persuaded them to treat women with less care than they should have. Does that make sense to you? But God. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, you know, and, uh, and, and in a way, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was not intended, it wasn't even viewed by Abraham as being malicious. I mean, he cared about his wife, 
but at the same time, he didn't want to die, you know? And uh, so, I mean, it was, he, he is a fallen man. He's not born again, you know? And uh, um, at the same, also, <laughs> I mean, we can see um, times of tenderness between them, that they must have had a relationship. It wasn't just, a, you know, it wasn't a, 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 a relationship where there was no talking, no, no um, intimacy. There was clearly some of that. You can see it crop up in the language that she was about them and between them. Um, but it was nothing like a new covenant marriage under, under grace. So uh, um, there was a long, a long way to go before people understood what, what authority and submission looked like inside of the godly context. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, there's a lot of selfishness and a lot of um, ugliness to that. And that's exactly what male um, uh, uh, dominated societies will always be ugly if it's not governed by God's influence. Because it's always going to be, it's a, the enemy's always going to see to it through the flesh it's taken to the worst possible place of people. And, uh, and of course, God never intended that. Uh, God showed us repetitively through Jesus, whoever is leader is servant of all. You know, so from the garden, God intended man to be the head, but in his headship, he also served, she served him, she existed for his benefit but he would find himself serving her. Because, you know, it was just a feast of love between the two of them. Between the two of them. You know, that was what it was intended to be. Jesus is, you know, the Lord of all of us, and he was bowing and, you know, cooking fish and washing feet, right? And yet no one questioned when the man stood up, he's in control. He's Lord. He's the one I bow my knee to. I exist for his benefit. Nothing about him bowing down and humbling himself and washing my feet ever took that away from him. In fact, if anything, it held him in higher esteem. And that's the way God intended marriage to be between a man and a woman. Um, one thing I thought of, though, too, um, is trust. Mm -hmm. Because like Jesus, when he told his disciples to get in the boat and go on the other side, and the storm came and they panicked, mm -hmm. his, God's promise to Abraham hadn't happened yet. Right? No. Yeah, no. So he needed to trust God he wouldn't be killed. That's right. Right? Oh, absolutely. And he yeah, also trust that uh, he should have trusted, of course, like Terry was insinuating, not only for his own well-being, but also trusting that God is, um, he can go in there calling the woman his wife, knowing that God's going to protect her because it's from her, through her, that your offspring's coming. So he should have gone into town saying, this is my wife. And you better not touch her. There's Almighty God's with me. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? But And he didn't. So, you know, which, again, this is another attestation to the fact that we're dealing with humans. You know? And and, and fallen humans at that. <laughs> right? Because Abraham is not part of the new birth. You know? He was just the very beginning of covenant. Yes, Terry? Just the thought just came to me, too. Because he mentioned in here that that it was a basically a plan that they had made back when they first oh, yeah. got together. Mm -hmm. And that's dangerous for all of us when we go to the fallback plan and don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. You oh, know, yeah. it's what we had already decided on years ago. We just have always done it. Yeah. You know, but, you know, I think, you, again, we need to constantly be coming before the Lord, Absolutely. not just going to our fallback plan. Exactly. And, and, you know, uh, you're right. And the, the, the fallback plan should have immediately changed as soon as God spoke. When God spoke, it should have called into question the fallback plan. You know, if he really is um, El Shaddai, if he is with me and he is for me, he's already blessed me and promised me these things, well, then I should no longer have, that's inconsistent with this fallback plan. Right? And he got it in some areas. He didn't get it in others, just like you and I. When it came to his wealth, he had no question that God was his provider. I mean, you remember when they, with the exchange with uh, um, uh, when he went to war and he did not want to receive anything, you know, lest anybody be able to say that someone made rich, God, Abraham rich, but God Almighty, right? He understood that. He got that completely. But in other areas, in regarding his safety and stuff like that, he still was not quite trusted. So, you know, we, when we find ourselves in the same situation, we can find someone similar in the face of Abraham. A great man who had and struggled with the same things you and I did. So, uh, 
What are some other thoughts? All right, here's a question. Mm -hmm. um, as Hagar took her son, he sent them out. Well, not yet, but yeah. We're well, still... oh, we're st you, you, you want me to Let's, wait? We can stay on both chapters. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. That's fine. Um, God saved his life. Mm -hmm. And they grew up then apart. Apart, absolutely. Okay. But not real far from each other. No, the wilderness of Paran is not that far away. Is there, if I'm, I'm reading it right, they're still in um, um, the greater Middle East. Abimelech's area. I really am not entirely certain how far Abimelech's area reached at that time point in the period. Um, well, I don't know. It's a good you're question. talking about Ishmael and Hagar? And yeah, yeah, whether or not he was still sojourning in the area of the Philistines. I mean, I, 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 mean, I think it insinuates that in, in one place. Well, you know, it like, says that he took a wife from Egypt. That's in 21. Yes. Um... Which he, they may have been in Egypt to do that, or they may have run across one. We don't know where they were. I mean, we just know they went to the wilderness of Paran Hall. Yeah. Well, that's okay. So that's what I'm saying. We do know they went and they dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. But I'm not, my the reason why I can't quite answer your question is because I'm not sure whether or not the wilderness of Paran was included in the land of the Philistines at the, that time. I'm not sure. I wish I knew, but I don't know. I just wasn't sure whether they were talking about. Um, Ishmael here as it you know not to deal falsely with him or his son or no, what, what, where Michael are you? Uh, or how do you pronounce his name I say Michael like, he's making a covenant he says now therefore swear to me by God this is in uh, Genesis 21 20, uh, 21 23 yeah well I'm not sure what is that well, what does that have what to do are they, with? Is, are they talking about Ishmael here? No, yes. no, 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 no. This is this right here is Abimelech talking to um, to Abraham. Okay, so Abimelech in verse twenty two, there's there's definitely a change in yes. topic. Mm -hmm. Right, says, and it came to pass at that time, at the same time that this was happening, Abimelech. on the other, you know, in other words, um. Uh, Hagar and Ishmael had already separated, and time had passed. And this right. is one of the things that's not always easy to keep up with in Scripture because sometimes in a verse, a lot of time passes. Like um, Isaac was born, and a verse, one verse later, he's being <laughs> weaned. And yeah. back then, children were weaned at the age of twelve or thirteen. So we're talking about he's almost a teenager. So twelve years have passed <laughs> in one verse. Well, you know, and as soon as that happens, so at this point, Ishmael is probably in his early 20s. And so, um, which is why it sounds weird where it says that um, Hagar took him and placed him. But the word in place him doesn't mean like a child in the cradle. It means she just said, stay there, right? And when she took him, she took him by the hand and led him. He was still a young man. Yeah. But, um... God had sent them out, and they dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And so when he was around 20-whatever, and they were living in the land of Paran, at that time period, this is what happened in verse 22, and at the same time it came to pass that Abimelech um, and the commander of his armies came, spoke with Abraham, saying, God uh, God is with you, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, okay, well, all right, that just answered my own question because I just saw it for the first time. That actually, who's doing the talking? Yes, Abimelech was doing the talking to Abraham. And I so he's like, it was the other kindly. way. Oh, okay, okay, I understand what you're saying. But yeah, it was Abimelech talking with Abraham, and this was, okay. it's entirely possible this may have been even a couple of years after their separation. Yeah, if I just read it a little bit <laughs> That's okay. No, it's easy to get lost sometimes in that. It doesn't always say, it's not like in, in American books where, you got a chapter division necessarily, and it says, and now we're going to start talking about <laughs> Abraham and Bethlehem. So, yeah. All right. So, I, uh, Ishmael, I mean, reading this, it, it sounded like he was a really small. Child, yeah, but he wasn't. No. But he wasn't. Oh, certainly not. That was not. my question. No, he was 13 years old when Isaac was born. 
And so when the boy was weaned, even if he was weaned early by that culture standard, which would have still been, if it, weaning did not take place early back then. It's not like we do today. You try to get a kid off the breast like before years ago, and that's not the way other cultures do that. And to be honest with you, it's really not healthy for the child. It's much more healthy for the child for him to be weaned at a much later age. Um, our culture would think it was very odd, but it was actually, it's a whole lot more healthy for a child. Um, so, but so let's just say that he was five or six by the time he was weaned from his mother. You're still talking about at that point. Then um, Ishmael would have been at least nineteen, if not twenty. So um, you know, and he was deriding this young man. It wouldn't have done a whole lot of good to make fun of a young boy <laughs> who's this big. He didn't ever know. Yeah. This was a young boy. You know, so I mean, at the age five, six, seven, he was still being breastfed. But that was normal back then. And in other cultures around the world, that's still normal. It's not normal in America because we want to get it done, get it out of here. You know, it's an inconvenience. Yeah, throw a woman in jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, uh, but, uh, so he was obviously old enough. Um, Isaac was obviously old enough for Ishmael's taunting him to register in his mind that I'm being made fun of. You know, he wasn't just a, an infant in, in, wrapped up in baby clothes so so anyway so yeah so we know that uh, Ishmael was sent off when he was probably close to 20 also tells you a little bit about the maturity of this person at the age of 20 he's picking on a five year old I mean that's just pathetic you know but anyway yes uh huh um if you're through with that go ahead um I had a question about <clears throat> that very thing, uh, the they um, kind of like a covenant swear to me. Um, how did this play out when Israel conquered the land? Well, the covenant was just between Abraham. It wasn't. It wasn't between Abraham's offspring. It was from Abraham and Abraham to Abimelech and Abimelech's offspring and his posterity, but as only as far as Abraham was going. He didn't say anything about Abraham did not say all of my generations will do this. Okay. Thank you. I was looking so, I'm going, whoa, you know, they're gonna get their land taken. And, away and from beyond them. that, it doesn't really make a lot of difference because one of the things that you see when the law is given is that uh, and of course the law is all when it talks about relationships that we have here on earth, they're all representing our relationship with God. Now, one of the things that God says um, in in uh, the law is that a father has got the right to make void the void the any promise or any word that his son makes up to a certain age until he is mm -hmm. on his own, mm -hmm. and any word his wife ever makes her entire life or any word that his daughter <coughs> makes through her entire life <coughs> until she comes underneath another underneath another man by being married. Mm -hmm. So the father could void any word you gave, mm -hmm. and so. As God, God as Abraham's father, through Moses, he could have said, "I'm uh, you don't. I'm not asking you to keep the word that Abraham swore to uh, to the Philistines because I'm your father, and I said conquer them." Oh, good, thank you. So uh, you know uh, that, and that's the way, and that's the way it is here in, in now in the body of Christ. I mean, God, you can swear yourself to something. God's like, uh, I didn't say you could do that, and He can make void anything you say because mm -hmm. He's your dad. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the authority of a father. So, uh, what else? You, you said you just off the top of your head mm -hmm. an example of what you just said, because I'm trying to think of one. Um, well, one that would have been perfect would have been, um, and uh, it, it would have been um, the word that uh, the uh, the one man gave concerning his daughter when he said, you know, that he would offer up as a sacrifice, whatever it was, when he first, that he first laid eyes on when he came back from war. And of course, to his, his dismay, he ran across his, his daughter. Um, now, it, Jewish tradition um, has that playing out two different ways. Um, it's clear that he did not offer up his daughter as a sacrifice because he would have to break the law to do it. Well, yeah. um, so he had to dedicate her to the temple for service, which meant that she could never, ever, ever, ever marry and she would never have offspring, which is why she went into mourning. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that God could have made void the words of this man. And in fact, if he had sought God through a prophet, probably would have. 
but didn't bother asking. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, um, uh, uh, there's, there's, there are a few examples I can't tell you off the top of my head, but it doesn't matter. Even if we never actually saw it playing out, it's definitely in the law that a father may, can make the void any, any commitment that a wife or a daughter ever makes, period, um, until that daughter becomes the wife of a, another man, at which point he has no authority, the husband does. Um, and he can make void the word of any of his sons up into the age where he separates and establishes his own, his own household. At that point, he is responsible for his work. So um, I believe that's found in numbers, I think. It would make sense. Yeah. Anyway, other thoughts? Um, it's kind of interesting how society has changed. Because, you know, the, the king was with that guy's wife and found out, and, you know, as a, as a testimony said, I didn't do anything with this woman, mm -hmm. I'm giving you a thousand silver pieces, mm -hmm. whereas now it's like, if you didn't do anything with the woman, why are you paying this man? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, you did something you're paying for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different cultures view things different ways, mm -hmm. don't they? <laughs> and somebody's word was binding. I mean, you see it, you know, in the covenants, we get kind of, it, this is what you're saying, because I'm saying this, I didn't do it, mm -hmm. this is my proof mm -hmm. that I didn't, yeah. and they did it in, in merchandise or, you know, yeah. monetarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that what Abraham did with the, the well? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He yeah. gave... Seven. Well, he well he gave the shiva seven ewe lambs in order at, as a testimony that I dug this well, mm -hmm. you know. So one of your people in your land has been stealing water from my well and seizing it, and uh, he was trying to tell them like, deal with this. See, this is this is somebody in your kingdom. You deal with it. Mm -hmm. He's like, I didn't even know what was happening until you brought it up to me. But uh, and so he said, well, I'm going to give you these seven ewe lambs. And they cut a covenant. And then he sets aside seven new lambs and says, I want you to take them. Those are a testimony that I'm the one that dug this well. So if anybody asks a question, those are a testimony. It's kind of like they would plant memorial trees or they'd set up rocks and stuff like that that were given as testifiers or signs or something. Is that what um, Abraham was doing was he plants the tree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, it was to commemorate an event. And then a lot of times they would do they do it with uh, they would they would build um, rock they build altars or um, uh, whenever they had an experience with God mm -hmm. they would plant a collection of rocks in order to establish boundaries for land and then they would plant trees often in order to have proof of an ongoing covenant between two people or sometimes even plant it as an ongoing proof of something that God promised so. Um, yeah, it was just a, uh, and it, a lot of times it would do something like that because it was ongoing, you know, and it had life in it, you know, it would grow. So. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because I don't know if anybody paid any attention to when uh, President Trump was in Israel, but they planted a tree. Yeah. There was a whole garden there where mm -hmm. they had planted trees. Yeah. Commemorating and uh, symbolizing or something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So That's what that would be it. about. Absolutely. That's a culture that has not, not changed. We have to do that. Kind of thing. So you're right. Very good. Let, let me look at so I bring up some of the things that I saw, and then if you see some of the things, uh, bring them up as we go. Obviously, um, we kind of brought up already in chapter 12, 20 that Abraham does it again. He acts deceitfully. Um, it's an ongoing problem with that lineage. Um, also, it's interesting that uh, you know we know that people were longer lived back then. At 90, Sarah was still pretty good looking. Mm -hmm. You know, that people were wanting her. So, uh, you know, at, at 90 now, that's really not happening so much. <laughs> you know, but, you know, at 90, she was still, you know, she turned some heads. So, um, God, of course, warns uh, Ben like in a dream, and God closed all the wombs of his house until the situation was rectified. Uh, ben like apparently knew about God. Um, uh, of course, uh, um, as I said before, Shem is still alive, and uh, uh, so and, and really the dispersion was a semi still considered a semi recent event, you know, because like I said, there's still people that were alive um, uh, from the flood 
uh, just after, and most certainly alive after the dispersion. So uh, uh, at the Tower of Babel. So um, they would have been long lived because because remember Shem had a very <coughs> long lifespan. The, anybody born after the flood, their their lifespan was cut pretty much in half at least at best. And then the next two generations from that, people lived a maximum of about 250 years. And then a couple of generations from that, only about 150. So, and Abraham was falling in between that gap right there. So did Job, by the way. Um, Job was probably about, probably lived about 300 some odd years, something like that. Um, so, you know, you know, the dispersion was only like maybe something that happened from their great grandparents. So they still heard stories about it. It was still some semi-recent event. So, um, so he 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 was aware of this God that uh, that Abraham served. Um, notice there seemed to be an inner knowing that the true God of all the earth would not do wrong and destroy a nation that was innocent. It didn't seem to be a question in his mind. I mean, it, it, he he obviously believed God was powerful to go th follow through with his his threat, if you will, you're going to die if you don't do this, right? Mm -hmm. And so he didn't question God's power, and yet he had enough boldness to ask God the same question that Abraham did, you know? Would the God of heaven do what is wrong and judge a righteous nation, mm -hmm. an innocent nation, right? So clearly God's reputation is still known on some level, you know, and I think that's, that's very, very important. God, it, also notice here, the scripture does not say that God just tried to influence him. It said God kept him back from sinning. It, it didn't say, I tried, I tried, you know, I influenced you, but really the end result was really your decision. It says, I kept you from doing it. Because I knew your heart was innocent in this whole thing, I didn't let you go one step further and do what was wrong. I kept you from sinning. Mm. But would it have been sinning if he didn't know it was wrong? No, it wouldn't have been sin, but it would have been wrong. Sin is to know to do right and do it not. Do so it. that right. would, yes. But if he did not know... That it would have still been the wrong thing to do. It would not have been sin. Now the question is, at that point, one of the reasons why God would have held him culpable, number one is because regardless of anything else, God is in covenant with Abraham. So, Period. Whoever does anything against Abraham, he said, I'm going to be against them, yeah. period. So he's always spoken that. So if Abimelech finds himself on the wrong side of the fence, Abimelech is on the wrong side of the fence. So by just the fact of taking Sarah yes. was wronging <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Wronging Secondarily, um, you know, we don't know what the customs were and stuff like that, but one way or the other, it could have, you know, bottom line is Abimelech could have found out. I mean, she came into town with him ask mm. right you know now granted you know um you know maybe he did ask i don't know because obviously the information was transferred to him either by request or by them just saying it this is my sister he's my brother but you know one way or the other if abimelech had done this it still would have been wrong though it would not have been sent well, wasn't it God that revealed it to him in a dream? Yes, God revealed it to him into a dream. So, I mean, uh, but I want what the big issue is that, that one of the things that you're bringing up, and I think it's, a, it's a something that's very important for us to recognize that, you know, people do wrong all the time without them knowing that it's wrong. And so they're still planting seeds, and they're still going to reap a harvest of what they planted, even if they didn't have any knowledge that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. So, God's not holding them accountable as far as being sent. Right? Because they didn't know it. But they still planted bad seed, and that fruit is still going to produce bad fruit. Mm -hmm. I mean, not understand. It's kind of like in America, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Mm -hmm. And maybe you didn't know, but you know you could have known. Maybe you should have known. But it doesn't change the fact that what you did was wrong. Right? So, you know, God definitely held him back, but God held him back because of the innocence. It says so. The scripture says, "Because you, I know that I know that you did this in the innocence of your heart, the innocence of your heart, which is why I held you back from sinning against me." Now, if he'd done it with knowledge, God wouldn't have held him back, and he probably would have just killed him. Period. But instead, because he was doing what he was doing in ignorance, God held him back from it actually becoming a sin. Right. So, uh, uh, but then God also still had power in man's left power in the man's hand because he told him, he said. 
if you do not deliver her back, I'm still killing you. Right? So he gave him opportunity to make the decision, I'm not going to bring her back. He, God, it's not like God just teleported her out of his house. Mm -hmm. It was going to be a Benelux decision whether or not to let her go or not. And then based on that decision now, it would be sin or be righteousness based on what his action was. Right? If he held her back, God had killed her. But he didn't hold her back. He did what was right, and God blessed him. So, uh, you know, we know that God blessed him. Because of that. how do we know that? He lived. Well, yeah, he lived. <laughs> but how would we know that that would have been God's plan anyway? I'm sorry. I'm not how do we know that God's plan, because we really don't read anything further on that shows that Abimelech was blessed. But we already know that he was. Why? How do we know that? Because, because God's a merciful God, but that's because we know that. Okay, but there's more to it than that. He is merciful, but there's more to it than that. What were you going to say? He, he honored Abraham. Okay, and what does that mean? And he who honors me, I will honor Exactly. He said, yeah. if you bless, whoever blesses you, I will well, bless, is what God said. So not all, he returned his wife. Well, that's just doing what's right and keeping him from dying. But he went above and beyond that. He gave him stuff. He gave a thousand dollars to re, a thousand silver to redeem her name. And then he said, "Behold, my land is before you. Settle anywhere you want to. The land's yours." He was blessing him. And what does that mean? God's going to do? He's going to bless Abimelech in his household in his kingdom. And he probably Abimelech didn't probably didn't even know God. He, probably. Yeah. I don't know. He, he definitely knew that God would not judge the innocent. That He clearly had some knowledge of God. How far his knowledge of God went, we don't know. Well, enough but, to know uh, that he was hearing from him. Yeah, yeah he, he definitely knew who he was. But he may not have known that God would have blessed him. He just did this because, you know what? Your God's clearly powerful, and I'm going to put as many well, good chips in there as possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not that far from the flood here either. No, they're not. So, I mean, if they know that God is big enough to wipe out the whole earth, yeah, you don't want to be on his bad side. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty a, powerful, dude. That's yeah, right. So, uh, so, but you know, but we know. That I just want you to understand that as we read this, you can understand that by the time a thousand years later, when Israel took that land from the Philistines, it was a blessed land. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we know it was blessed is because God blessed Abimelech and that nation because of the way He treated. Abraham. Now later on, long after Abimelech's death, the Philistines wore a thorn in the side of Israel, and they they gave Israel a hard time. But as long as long as Abimelech was alive, they were treating Abraham with respect, and God blessed Abimelech his household and Philistines for that. So, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so God kept back Abimelech from Sarah and thus from sin. God identifies Abraham here the, for the first time as a prophet. He says he is a prophet, mm -hmm. right? Um, even though Abimelech was innocent here, God still required Abraham to pray for him. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the reasons for this was because of the fact that God's covenant was with Abraham. And this man had taken his wife, though he'd done nothing wrong with her, he took her. And even though it was with Abraham saying the whole time, that's my sister, doesn't matter. You still took her, right? And God's like, you know, I will restore back the fertility in their household, but I require my covenant man to pray for you. You notice this also happened in the book of Job. The, the, the three friends that were giving him counsel, and before the entire event was over, it probably uh, Job's trials, we, most people believe, probably lasted about nine months. I'm not exactly sure what they used to track that as far as time is concerned, but it was a protracted period of time. And um, uh, and uh, they had gone from trying to give him good counsel, and some of the things they said were right. Um, some th sometimes it was just the way they said, it and the attitude they said it in was wrong. Because if you see what Elihu said, a lot of the things Elihu said showed up in what the other three uh, people said. But when Elihu said it, he was right, and God never reproved Elihu, but he repro reproved the three brothers. I mean, the, I mean the three friends. A lot of it had to do with their attitude of accusation against Job in the saying of it. And some of the things they said were just plain wrong anyway. 
But I want you to notice that at the, at the very end, when God reconciled Job back to his heart again, then God said, God spoke to those three guys and said, you know what? It's not going to go well for you. you. You need to go and you need to ask Job to pray for you so that I don't, I don't essentially say I don't kill you. And so Job offered up sacrifices, prayed for them, and of course they lived. So this is already this this happened before Abraham. So someone that God is in covenant with, someone that God is in relationship with, you don't come against them. If you do, it's not good. Now you also understand this is before the age of grace. In our day, God continues to pour mercy out on them, right? On our even on our enemies. And God, this is the reason why the Scripture says, and we just read it on Sunday, that. If you are reviled for the sake of Christ, blessed are you. If you do what is right and are persecuted for it and for um, and remain under it out of consciousness sake towards God, it says you are doing what is right and to this you were called because Christ also suffered wrongfully, right? <laughs> we're living in a different covenant in a different age. Back then under that covenant, it was an eye for an eye. You do wrong to my Abraham, you do wrong to my covenant person, and you are in a truckload of trouble. Now, if you do something wrong to a child of God, God will establish mercy for that person. And the child of God is praying mercy for their enemies. You see what I'm saying? But you see, David, what does he say? God, I ask you to bring my desire upon my enemies. And his desire on his enemies were not good desires. <laughs> they were bad things. He wanted evil to come on his enemies. Yeah. Consume them as, a moment, as in a moment. Cause them to fall in pits of fire that they can't get out of. You know, cause whatever it is that they were wanting to do to me, cause it to come back on their head seven times. Yeah. That was the kind of stuff David prayed. You and I, under the new covenant, say, God says, bless those who persecute you. Love them. Pray for them. Right? So, so there is a difference there in covenants. Are you seeing? There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. But in this time period, you come against Abraham and you just came against God. And this is not under a covenant of mercy. You're about to have your head knocked off your shoulders. So, uh, so God says, Abraham, I want you to pray for them. And when Abraham prayed, God heard Abraham's prayer and restored back the fertility of, um, of Emlet's household. So the blessing, God's establishing the through whom is the blessing going to be coming into this earth. Mm -hmm. Just like he said, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Yes. Right? So God was not going to deal with Abimelech directly, unless it was for judgment. But if he was going to bless him, or restore back to him, he was going to do it through his covenant man. So you know, this is, this, I'm bringing it up because this is one of the first times we're seeing it. So as we see it, as we progress through the Old Testament, you're going to, you're, it's going to, you're going to come to expect it. See what I'm saying? Because, you know, this is the way God operates. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, Abimelech uh, goes above and beyond, like I said before, I, um, uh, um, settled on, um, he said, told him to settle on any of his land that he wanted, and they gave him a thousand pieces of silver for Sarah's honor. Now, in chapter 21 and verse 1, the Lord did, notice he says, for Sarah, what he had promised to her. Now, we already know the promise was to Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. But I want you to notice that in here, God makes special mention that she's included, right? Mm -hmm. Even Sarah's own testimony was, the only reason I had this kid was for Abraham, right? I bore it unto him, right? But it's very important that God is singling out his princess, right? Which is what that means mm -hmm. by her name. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, you know what? Uh, the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. We, as we went through it like a week or two ago, um, God had told Abraham about um, that now you're in covenant with me and every male child must be circumcised, blood must be shed, entering them into the covenant, right? And he said, you know, from this point on, anyone born in your household, whether slave or free, on the eighth day. And so what happens? In verse 8, it talks about the eighth day, he was, uh, Isaac was circumcised in the covenant. Now, in verse 6 and 7, it's interesting because we read this before in another place, but it says, Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and everyone who hears will laugh with me. She also said, who would have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne to him a son in his old age. 
Now, wrapped up in all these words are things that have to do with the time period, and I want to be real careful here. This isn't just a cultural thing. This is stuff and knowledge that dates back to creation. They still know that male offspring is extremely important. They knew that from the very beginning. That was instilled in them in the garden. They, it didn't mean that female was not important. It, they were important. But the bloodline was always very, very important. Which is why the record is always going from father to son, father to son, father to son in chronology. It's not because God didn't know, know the other sons, but he always brings up the firstborn son. It's not that God didn't know the daughters and didn't, didn't value them, but they weren't part of the bloodline. Right? So God always brought up father to firstborn son, brought father to firstborn son. This was known. And so a woman, if all she did was give birth to daughters, felt worthless. And the reason why is not because they didn't value the daughters, but because of the fact that until I can give you a son, your name and the bloodline is not going to continue. Mm -hmm. Right? And so a woman, they didn't understand that the, 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 the sex of the child was not determined just by the woman alone. They didn't know that. And so a woman that only bore daughters was considered worthless. You know, what's wrong with you? You know, why can't you make a boy? <laughs> you know, and, uh, um, and, and uh, there's a lot of pressure on a woman, you know, and it's now we understand it was unfair pressure. Yeah. But, you know, but at the same time, we have a history in Israel of women crying out to God for a male offspring. And God heard them and saw to it they gave birth to a boy. So, if they would get involved and get God involved, they'd find that God would answer their prayer. And this was not answering the prayer of the, the husband. It was asking, answering the prayer of a, of a wife. God, give me male offspring for my husband. <laughs> and God would honor them. Right? So, uh, so you know, this uh, you see this all the way through history. The, the reason why I'm bringing this up now is because of the fact that Sarah is, uh, Sarah's language reveals a lot of her understanding of who she is in relation to Abraham. She is his helpmate, and one of the ways that the wife helps the husband is by being the vessel through which his name continues on the earth. Are you following? She considered this very important. And so she rejoiced that through her, a male child was born. So it's a very, very big deal. Yes, uh-huh. Just that uh, there's still hints you see every now and again with people that that there's still something instinctive about um, the woman giving the man a son. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, it's still there's this an instinctive knowing knowing that yeah. this there's something important about this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, now I know as far as God is concerned, I don't know that it's as important now by any means as it was before because God was establishing a natural nation, which required natural offspring, right? God is now building a spiritual nation, right? So, and daughters can do that as much as sons can do, right? But all the way up until the cross, bloodlines were very, very, very important. Now we live in a nation, the Bible says it has no boundaries. It's not, it's not, there is no Jew, no Greek, no, uh, no um, Scythian, no free, no slave. There is none of this, right? And so, you know, it's far less important today, but it still is part of our makeup. You're right. In, in, in people groups all the way around the world, it's instinctive. They just know this. It's important. So, well, I think, so. I, if nothing else, it's still a human thing and necessity for there to be continued male offspring who were raised in godly homes mm -hmm. to be the authorities and the men who carry things on. Absolutely. You know, because women can only do so much. There's, we're not mm -hmm. made for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that is so beautiful about other cultures that are what we would call less civilized. They're more intact with their roots. They, a village doesn't have to be told that women are not hunters. They know that. The, the women take care of the village. They do the things there, things the men really can't do, or even if they could do, they couldn't do as well. It's not that a woman can't carry a spirit. It's not that she can't do some of those things, but she wasn't designed to do it as well as a man. And the same things that the women do, the men could do, but they can't do it as well, and they were designed as well to do it as a woman. They know their place. And it's very important in villages that there's male <laughs> offspring. One of the reasons why is because they would starve without them. 
We need hunter-gatherers. We need providers, right? It's important that we have strong male um, leadership in the tribe. And so it, it's known around the world. And so it's not, it's, you're right, it's, it's, a, it's something that is instilled in us. It's kind of like an instinct. So, uh, okay, um, anyway, uh, it says, uh, um, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Um, a feast was done at, the, at Isaac, uh, as Isaac was winged. Ishmael mocked him. Sarah got ticked off, and she said to Abraham, Drive out this slave with her son, for the son of the slave will not be co-heir with my son Isaac. Notice how she gets real possessive of him now. <laughs> Before, he's your son, right? But when someone makes fun of her boy, that's my boy, <laughs> right? So uh, um, she's real possessive of this. But I also want you to notice that her words are considered scripture. Because Paul quotes them in Genesis, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 30, when he gives the illustration, and I read it to you before, but go ahead and turn it with your hand here, go back over there to Galatians chapter 4, we read it a few weeks ago, when we first brought up the whole Isaac Ishmael uh, um, thing. Paul uses these two boys as an illustration of the law, the old covenant, and the new covenant of grace. And uh, so um, uh, so he says here, let's see, starting in verse, uh, verse 21, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, the other by the free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman according to promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, means in other words, the Ten Commandments and the law, right? Which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, what's he about to say? What, by the words, it is written, he's quoting scripture, isn't he? Mm -hmm. It says, Rejoice, O barren, and do, not, uh, who do you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who do not travail. For the desolate have many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted he who was born according to the spirit, even so now it is. And we just read that, right? Mm -hmm. That Ishmael made fun of and, 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 and persecuted his younger brother, mm -hmm. right? which is what instigated Sarah saying, send her away and send that boy away, right? In verse 30, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Mm -hmm. Cast out the bondwoman with her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. What is scripture quoting? Or what is, whose words is scripture? Sarah's. Sarah's. Yeah. You see how God, God doesn't play favorites, mm -hmm. Right? What she said is encapsulated as scripture. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. And it's important. This is a woman. Mm -hmm. So what? She's important to God, mm -hmm. right? And when and when Abraham was, was disillusioned by this and his heart was broken because he loved Ishmael and he went to God about it, God said, I want you to listen to what your wife said. Mm -hmm. Do what she said, right? So God not only heard Sarah but agreed with her words and her words were included in and made part of scripture. Amen? So I just thought that was kind of interesting and important to point out, mm -hmm. especially in our church, because we've, we've gone through the whole thing with elders and male authority and stuff like that. So when things are brought up about women, I think it's very important to highlight it so we draw attention to it, because God doesn't play favorites. You know, we all have our role, and we all have our position, and what Sarah said is recorded as reliable scripture. Amen? So he says, Drive out the son, the slave with her son, for the, slave of the, uh, the, for the slave will not be co-heir with uh, my son Isaac. Now, this was a very difficult thing for Abraham because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be concerned about the boy and your slave. Whatever Sarah says to you, listen to her, because your offspring will be traced through Isaac. But I will also make a great nation of, um, of the slave son because he's your offspring. Notice God gives us the reason why is because he's your blood. Amen? So, 
Notice also that uh, um, uh, uh, um, just like with the Bemelech, here we have early in the morning, Abram went out and did what he needed to do. He didn't somebody else to do it. He did it himself. He's the one that put the, 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 the bread in her hand and the, the skin of, of water on her, on her shoulder, and he sent her away, and he rose up early in the morning to do it. He didn't wait, right? So that's another obedience thing that we see in Abraham. Hagar wandered in the wilderness, ran out of water, sat down to die. God shows up. He hears, he says, he noticed that he, um, he speaks to Hagar, but he said, I heard the boy. Right? He said, what are you upset about? I already told you I'm going to make this boy a great nation. I don't know what you're all freaked out about. And I've heard the boy cry. You know, uh, he's going to be okay. Take him by the hand. And so she went over there to take him by the hand. And God opened up her eyes. And she, he saw that within a bow shot, she was right next to a well. The whole time she was going to, she's set her mind, I'm going to die. And she's not even a bow shot from water. And this is really the way you and I live our life. We all are like, in the molly grubs, we're sitting under the tree, I'm just going to die. And he's like, you know, what's wrong with you? I mean, right there. You can see it. There's a well right there. You know? Well, what are you going to die for? Didn't I tell you I'm going to make this boy a great nation? Are you thinking I lied? But see, she's not keeping this in her mind, is she? Right? So and so God calls her on it, and he, he brings her back around. And, you know, of course, she goes and fills it up, and they left. Ishmael's descendants, we find out, are more Egyptian than Chaldean because of the fact that um, Ishmael's descendants are from... I mean, Ishmael himself was half Egyptian, half Chaldean. He was. Mm -hmm. But then his offspring is with an Egyptian wife, right? So the, the descendants of Ishmael are more Egyptian than they are Chaldean. Are you following? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Uh-huh. Um, I... If, it, if it's somewhere else in here, I don't remember it. Uh -huh. But did God tell Hagar he was going to make uh, Ishmael oh, yeah. the father of nations? It wasn't says, in this chapter. It was a couple chapters back. Oh, okay. Yeah, when she when okay. she first ran away because Sarah was mistreating her. Um, That's before he was born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God talked to Sarah, uh, talked to Hagar then and said, I'm going to make him a great nation. Right? Uh, so, I mean, God has spoken at least three times about um, uh, Ishmael. First to Hagar, then to Abraham, and then again to, um, well, uh, four times, because then he, he speaks to Abraham again about sending him away, then speaks to Hagar one last time and says, you know, I'm going to make him a great nation. It's going to be okay. So, um, so anyway, um, then there's a treaty that is made with Abimelech. We see that in chapter 21, verse 22 uh, through 34. Um, at that time, um, Abimelech, uh, well, we actually read it already, so I'm not going to go through it again. But uh, that treaty is actually very, very important. And we'll see how it plays out into something that's important in the next chapter when we cover it next week in chapter 22. But um, he, he dwelt in that land, um, Abraham dwelt in that land for some time. And uh, um, God wound up blessing them. He had a very good relationship with the inhabitants of that land. Um, uh, and the people in that land... As we can read in the, as we read in the next chapter, we'll find that the people in that land loved Abraham. Um, they thought highly of him. Um, they considered him a comrade and almost one of them. Um, uh, so, uh, and we'll read about that in chapter twenty-two when we get there. Um, spend some time in chapter twenty-two because I doubt that we're going to go beyond twenty-two next week because there's a lot we can get out of that one. Okay, that's a, it's not a very long chapter, but there's a lot of good stuff in it. So. Um, just spend some time in it, meditate on it, dig some, bring some stuff, right? Don't just let me do it all. You guys bring some stuff too, and uh, we'll learn, right? Have any other thoughts before we close? It may have just been a another one of those time-lapse things of telling the people so that they knew the general area, even though it may not have been established yet, but I found it interesting that the place of Beersheba that is named and solidified at the end of chapter 21 is referred to as the wilderness of Beersheba where Hagar was at mm -hmm. when God met her for the water. Exactly, yes. Just before the I agree, absolutely. Thing. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for your word, for uh, the fact that it's so detailed and it lets us know so much and that you don't bring up any of this stuff without a reason. And uh, it, it's incumbent upon us to find out why. What is it that you brought this up for? And uh, none of it's without cause. Lord, we thank you that you've, you are transparent not only with yourself, but also with your kids. Um, we all do some really good and some really goofy stuff. And uh, um, you, you don't hide any of it from our view, and we learn from one another. And, but we thank you for Abraham. We thank you for Sarah. We thank you for Hagar and for Ishmael. Lord, uh, <clears throat> we, we just ask that we learn from the life lessons, because the Scripture tells us in the New Testament these things were written down for our admonition, and they serve as examples for us. So, Lord, uh, help for us to learn from the examples uh, that they offer to us. And we thank you for it. We commit the learning of these things into your hands because you're the only true teacher. Spirit of God, enlighten our eyes and cause us to see the things in your word that we might glorify you and come to know you greater. It's in Christ's name that we pray.